How many people are just chasing their worth? That's why they're so stressed out is because they're trying to be so perfect. They're trying to get acceptance, they're trying to get validation from this external world. When frankly, the work they do, if they just accept themselves and own their nerdiness and own their playful self, they would be so, they would, be, they would just enjoy their life more. Welcome to Stress Free You. Discover how to turn off stress with a flick of a switch with Matt and Katie Rush and Rich Taylor. Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome to show number 52 of the Stress Free You show. Today's uh, podcast is how to rediscover your play for less stress. And let's be honest, we could all use a whole lot more playtime. Every adult out there needs to play a little more. That's right, so that's what we're gonna do. And we have an amazingly special guest today. Jeff Harry shows individuals and companies how to tap into their true selves to feel their happiest and most fulfilled. All by, whoop, you guessed it, playing. Jeff has worked with Google, Microsoft, Southwest Airlines, Adobe, the NFL, Amazon, and Facebook, helping their staff to infuse more play into the day to day. Jeff is an international speaker who has presented at conferences such as Inbound, South by Southwest, and Australia's Pause Fest. Note the pause. <laughs> Showing audience how major issues in the workplace can be solved using play. Jeff was selected by Bamboo HR and engagedly as one of the top 100 HR influencers of 2020 for his organizational development work around dealing with toxic people in the workplace. His play work has most recently been featured in the New York Times article, How Do We Add More Play to Our Grown Up Life Even Now? He has also been featured on AJ Plus, Soul Pancake, The South. South, uh, San Francisco Chronicle and CNN. While we spend most of our time pretending to be important, serious grown-ups, it's when we let go of that facade and just play that the real magic happens. Fully embracing our own nerdy genius, whatever that is, Jeff, gives you the power to make a difference and change lives. Jeff's, Jeff believes that we already have many of the answers we seek, and by simply unleashing our inner child, we can find our purpose and in turn help to create a better world or as i would say a gooder world jeff welcome to stress free you uh so welcome and um and and how can people reach you because we want them to know that from the very beginning oh how can they oh how can they reach me already all right oh yeah rediscoveryourplay.com that's where they could reach me dude that's fantastic man we're so excited you're here uh welcome to the stress for you show yeah, Jeff, I'm super excited. Jeff, yeah. you know, Matt and I never want to grow up. I mean, I'm in my <laughs> mid-60s and uh yes. I, I still feel like I'm married to like my opposite. She's very serious. And I'm always joking and she's looking at me like I'm like, what? He said, after 36 years, she still doesn't get me. But I'm never gonna grow up because it's so much it's like having fun. Who doesn't want to have fun? I mean, think exactly. about it. Amen. I mean, and so Amen. many people, if you think about kids on a playground, you've got a whole bunch of kids. They could be different races, different religion, different ethnic backgrounds. What are they doing? They have one common goal, having fun. Okay. Mm -hmm. Somehow when we grow up, and I'm sure you're going to tap into this, we lose that ability to have fun because like, you know, a teenager, oh my God, I don't want to be embarrassed. I mean, I remember my, when, when growing up, uh, my dad, when he would back up, he'd always like, in a country square station where I put his arm in the thing and then his face would be all like kind of mush, you know, like, you know, like really weird looking because he's backing up. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed he's doing that. Like, who's going to see that? You know what I mean? So I made sure when I had teenagers, I did the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd be like, dad, you're embarrassing. I'm like, we're in the car on a highway. There's no one around. Who, there's no cameras in the car. Who's going to see you? So anyway, what exactly happens uh, when people, I'm going to actually leave that to Matt. I'll, I'll let Matt kick off the first question there. <laughs> I can do it. So I'll ask uh, Jeff, why is play so important, uh, especially now? Well, you know, uh, Dr. Stuart Brown says this a lot. Um, the opposite of play is depression. Ooh. And when we're not able to embrace 
a play oriented mindset, what happens is what happened to a lot of people in 2020. You know, we, you know, adults get so fixated on specific results and expectations are the thief of joy that a lot of people back in December, 2019 had a vision of what 2020 was going to be. Mm-hmm. And when that did not happen, they were sorely disappointed. Um, and because of that, they weren't able, a lot of people weren't able to adapt or be resilient. I, I, I run a workshop called Your Future is Where Your Fun Is, where we literally have people write down what they wouldn't be able to do in 2020, fold it up into a piece of, uh, fold it up into a paper airplane and let it go. And the reason why we did that was because people had to let go what they thought it was going to be in order to create something amazing with the month and a half left that they have. You know, and when we're just talking about stress, like, you know, two things that I like to uh, first address is like adults for the most part are super boring. This is why you don't want to be an adult rich is because adults have some of the most boring conversations ever. Like, what do you do for a living? How's the weather? Well, the blah, 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 you know, and, and it's because they are, we're scared to show who we really are. But when you're embracing your nerdy self, when you are willing to have fun, then you actually show, you know, your humanity. You actually show your nerdiness. You actually are able to connect the way kids connect. Like you were saying earlier on the playground, when a kid runs onto the playground, they don't even introduce themselves. They go, you know, they just start playing the game. What are we playing? Tag? Oh, we're playing hide and seek. Okay, we just start running, right? You know, meanwhile, if an adult in a child's body was to go out there, would they be like, well, should I play tag or should I play hide and seek? Or maybe I should go here. Well, it's going to be kind of dangerous. And they just ruminate and ruminate and ruminate and then miss out on all the play that's right in front of them. I love that because it's so true too. You think about how adults even fly because you sit down and what do you do? You get in your own little world and you don't ever even speak to each other until the very end. And it's like at the very end and you're like, oh, hey, how's it going? And that way you don't have to talk to anybody until you're exiting the plane. It's like, what are we doing with ourselves? And you could have the greatest conversation. You could change your life by having that conversation. Not to mention, you know, you will look at some kids on planes and they're like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. This is amazing. You know, where is that wonder that adults yeah. have anymore? We don't, we don't have any wonder or curiosity. And that's where we could actually let go of our, a lot of our stress if we came and embraced more of our curiosity. Yeah, I think curiosity is uh, the, the old saying, curiosity killed the cat. Well, I, I don't know about that, but curiosity definitely kills creativity. Yeah, it's a good thing we're not and cats. Then, I mean, lack of lack of curiosity, I should say. Yeah, lack of curiosity because um, kids, when they're like, you know, two, three or four years old, they, they what's that? What's that? What's that? They, they right. ask constantly, what is this? What is this? And they want, they're curious. I mean, when kids are super curious like that, and somehow that just goes out of our, 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 our beings. And I think the people that keep that curiosity, okay, I'm reading this, I'm studying this. I'm gonna, they become the right. most fascinating, interesting, creative people. And then the other people are like, okay, I'm going to be an attorney. So I'm going to narrow everything in my life down to be, and I'm not picking on attorneys, but, or whatever they're going to be. And they focus their world on being a, the best attorney they could be and the most uncreative, unfun person in the world. Right. And, and just tying back into the curiosity kills the cat, but yes, maybe, maybe it does, but the cat had an interesting life. You know, <laughs> when, we, when we think of like the top regrets of the dying, I've been referencing this more and more. One of the biggest regrets of the dying, you know, is I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself and not the life others expected of me. Right. And there's so many of us that are trying to impress other people, I always ask this of my clients and, and just individuals, who are you trying to impress? You know, if it's not someone that you will care about in a year, why do you care, right? You know, uh, um, Viola Davis says, um, with every decision you make, right? You either claim who you are or you end up chasing your worth for the rest of your life. Perfect, they're trying to get acceptance, they're trying to get validation from this external world when frankly the work they do if they just accept themselves and own their nerdiness and own their playful self, they would be so, they would be, they would just enjoy their life more. And they would be so, there would be so less stress in their life. 
Well, and that's true. And you look at how many people that we know that if we are, we do embrace our nerdy inner self. And I think the three of us probably are pretty good at that. <laughs> a plus. <laughs> how many times have, have we been in a, a social situation? And when you are comfortable in your own skin, how much more comfortable everybody else is in theirs. And it's just like, it gives yeah. everyone the freedom to do. So then I would ask the question, Jeff, how can, how can being playful help you rediscover your true purpose? That's a great question. So before I say that, let me just respond to that last part of like, you know, when you're like in a group and hanging out with everyone, do you know that person that comes over and is like, there's too much fun happening over here because you know, there's so much laughter, right? And you're, they're the ones that are like pooping on the party and you're like, what are you doing? You know, like, let's allow yeah. ourselves to have fun. So, you know, tying it into our purpose, right? I think, I think the first thing is, is let's, let's just take a step back and understand and have compassion for ourselves as to why adults have not played as much, you know, because we're like, well, why don't we play this much? And I, I always love to answer the question with this answer, 148,000 no's. By the time you reach the age of 18, you will have heard the word no at least 148,000 times based off certain studies. In addition to that, maybe you've heard the word yes, maybe eight to 10,000 times, depending on how you were raised. Then you go to school where you're shut on all the time, your parents shut on you, your teachers shut on you, adults shut on you all the time. You should do this, you should do that, you should do this, you should major in this. And then you get to your teen years, as you were saying earlier, Rich, you know, and now they have social media and all of social media or any media that's just bombarding us you know, we get more information in a day that people got in 1950 in a year. And mm -hmm. all that information is telling you, you're not enough. You should be someone else. Stop being yourself. And then people, whenever you act like yourself, and I wonder, Rich and Matt, if you've ever had this where, you know, someone says to you, like, stop, you're just too much right now. You're being too <laughs> mischievous. You're just, you're just too uh, everything. Um, so you, you're, so you're fighting all of that. So in order for you to actually play, play is such a rebellious, revolutionary act to start a podcast, to create a video, to put yourself out there, to be really nerdy is so difficult because society is not supporting any of that. It's telling you all the time to be someone except yourself, right? So that's the first thing we have to like recognize, right? So then the way in which you can rediscover your purpose is if you think about it, when you were a child, like you knew what you wanted. You were very clear on what you wanted. Like I run a workshop called, um, you know, your future is where your fun is, where we had, we explore what kids, what adults love to do when they were a kid and they identify their play core values. So like, you know, I do it with my colleague, Lauren Yee, and she loved playing sardines as a kid. It was this game, it was reverse hide and seek. One person hides, everyone else finds her and they start hiding and it's like packing like sardines, right? Um, but what did she love? She loved the creativity of it. She loved the collaboration of it. She loved the connection of it. So you take those play core values and then you go, wait a minute, now, what are the things that I do now or I could do now that tie into my purpose now, that tie into what I can do that will actually get me into a flow state that gets me to the point where, you know, I forget about time because I define play as any joyful act where you're fully present in the moment, where you let go of purpose, you let go of results, you uh, don't have anxiety about the future, you don't have regrets about the past, you're just fully you, you're just fully being you. And that's when you're in your flow state and that's when you create your best work and are truly yourself. You know, I, I, I've always felt my entire life, I've act it like there was a camera right in front of me. I mean, right now there is because we're doing this this show, but even long before that, I've always like, I always was acting out and that's just who I am. And I'm a, I'm, I'm an artist, I went to art school. Maybe I'm the creative type that just never fit into the typical, you know, uh, college type bound type person or whatever. But I remember one time, it was several years ago, my wife works for a school system as a school nurse and they had a, a Christmas party over someone's house. 
And I was just, I don't drink. I don't, I don't do drugs or anything like that, but I'm just goofy all the time. And I remember one time we were sitting there with a bunch of her coworkers and I was just like acting out things. And next thing you know, I'm barking like a dog. And my wife is just going like, I, I got to work with these people. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just losing it. I'm just like going off like a Robin Williams thing. Nowhere as good as Robin Williams, but I was just doing a, a funny rant. And, right. and like, she's like, I got to work with these people tomorrow. Oh, don't do this. <laughs> that just encouraged me all the more. <laughs> maybe I'm crazy, Rich and Matt, but I feel like we're the sane ones. You know, we're like the comedians that are lifting the veil on all of the BS because I feel like adults are always pretending. I wear this stupid Lego bow tie, right? I, I started wearing it at conferences and I wore it because I thought that people always were wearing a costume. So I yeah. was like, well, if everyone else is wearing a costume, I might as well put one on and mock the idea of like us being playing dress up and acting like adults and being like, oh, look how much money I make. And look at how much this, look at this, look how important I am, you know, because like, we just don't take that seriously. It's just like, I don't need to get the approval of this random stranger. They're, they don't impress me. Oh, that's good. So you talked about flow state. So what, I mean, what happens to the brain when someone is in flow play? Yeah, so that's a great question. So your prefrontal cortex, right? That's the part of you that is actually protecting you from the dangers of the world. You know, that's the one that protected you back in the caveman times from the tiger or whoever it is that's chasing you. And in that prefrontal cortex is your inner critic. You know, it's that mean voice that's saying stuff, but it's also there to warn you about stuff. But when, you're, when your brain goes from that beta state into a flow state, you actually go through something called transient hypnofrontality. And, it, and actually your inner critic starts to dissipate. And as that happens, your implicit mind starts to appear and you become highly creative. And then you get this shot of dopamine and you become very curious and instead of just seeing one result, as many of adults do, right, you start to see all of these opportunities in front of you. And if you think of the groomzilla and the bridezilla, you know, I talk about this of like, the day has to go a certain way. And if it doesn't, then it's just, it's just ruined, right? But when you're in this flow state, there's so many different opportunities, you know, and you know, you've been there when you've traveled and you're like, what do you want to do today? And you're like, I'm going to say yes to this and yes to this. And you just go on this this pathway and you have this adventure that you never thought was possible because you're willing to just say yes to everything. Well, and going along with that, unleashing your, your creativity, look at, and, and you've spoke to some of these companies, look at some of these mega major companies that have changed their entire model of how, how they operate in an office. And I'm sure you can address that. Right, right. I mean, I mean let, let's explore, you know, when, when I talk to a lot of companies, they're like, oh, yeah, play is frivolous, right? But when you talk to them about getting people, their staff in the flow, then they're like, oh, yeah, I oh, want to yeah. do that. And, and part of the reason why they do that is look at Google, you know, 20, they, Google had the 20% rule where they gave their staff 20% of their time where they could do any project they want, as long as it helps the organization, out, right? So they can explore their curiosity. What did that lead to? Gmail, Google Meet, all these huge billion dollar ventures that they pursued later on because they gave their staff the freedom to do this. Now, you know, the, like literally as Kevin Carroll says, the future is where the fun is. So what companies are actually having fun? What companies are still staying engaged with their staff even in this virtual environment and are focused on having meetings that people leave energized with? Those are the teams that are actually thriving while there are other ones that are like, oh, now we're in this virtual state, our virtual, you know, uh, so let's keep our meetings, you know, really, really dry. We'll go through the to-do list and then get off, you know, and they're not focused on the thing that they really should be focused on, which is focusing on culture, focusing on building relationships, focusing on getting your, helping your employees get more in their flow state by simply asking them, what is the work that you love to do most? How much of the work of that work do you do in a, a given like week? Oh, five, five percent only. How can I help you get from five percent to seven percent? That would communicate to them that not only you care, but it's going to help all the rest of their work because now they're able to be more of themselves at their job. Yeah, I think that's great. And as a as a graphic designer, that's what I do at my regular day. 
uh, I've been in a lot of boardrooms. We're all sitting around there. Okay, let's brainstorm. Let's brainstorm. That's the worst place you could be to oh, brainstorm. It's the worst. You're all staring at each other, and and your your brain goes like literally flat. So I, my idea of brainstorming would be like I'll go off to the park. I'll start throwing a frisbee around or something like that. Right. I'll start playing. That's when and all of a sudden it's weird. People don't understand this, and I don't. I'm sure you know the science to this, but we have a foreground and a background. I'm just keeping this really simple. And if you're in the foreground, you're in the meeting and you're looking at people and you're like, okay, pressure's on me because I got to come up with something because I'm the creative director or whatever. And if I don't, oh, how does that affect my work, my job and my status here? The background is, uh, that's where all the creativity comes from. But if you're in the foreground, stress will keep you in the foreground. Lack of stress will allow the creativity to flow. So you're out there throwing a frisbee around, having a great time, yelling and screaming. Oh, oh, that's a great idea. I'll write that down. Here's another right. good idea. Here's another right. good idea. So the last place I would ever want to be is in a boardroom, staring at people, doing a brainstorm. It's really not a brainstorm. I mean, it's like a, a brain freeze is what it's like. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 a it's like almost like a brain lockdown. It's like you're being held captive and be like, I want your best ideas right now. And it's just <laughs> like, oh, this is painful. But this even ties in more with I've been exploring this more and more, the eight hour work week. I mean, the eight hour work day, where does it come from? I was so curious about that. So I recently looked that up and it was, it was created by Jim Cohn, a labor activist, a Welsh labor activist back in 1814, where he was like, hey, we should have eight hours of leisure, eight hours of work, eight hours of sleep. 1814, right? No one paid attention to that for over a hundred years. And then um, Henry Ford, who had people dying on his assembly line because he was working them 11 to 15 hours a day was just like, okay, maybe we, I shouldn't do this. I'm going to cut it down to an eight hour work week. And then I'm going to double their salaries. And people were livid. They were so angry at him at the time because they're like, what are you doing? Don't give away all this money and then have them work less. And productivity went up. His, his obviously Ford flourished during that time. But since 1917, no one questioned why we work eight hours a day. Wow. Yet, when you actually do studies on how, what the average amount of work a, a person in America actually does in that eight hours, two hours and 53 minutes. Get and out. The work day, and the workday is extended due to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. We now work 8.8 .8 hours. So what are they, what are people doing for five and a half hours? Stupid meetings, making up work just to make up work, you know, going and getting coffee, social media, news, like they're, people are just killing time. They're yeah. just like, we're just wasting away. And, and then we claim that we're workaholics because we're, but we're doing a lot of work that's not totally unnecessary. So like as a team leader, if I was talking to someone, I would be saying, what is the work that is most important that you want your staff to do? Because you have about three to four hours for them to do it in a given day. So how do you get them in the work they love to do the most instead of forcing them to do the work that is not in their zone of genius? Yeah. I took over an organization as CEO. It was a kind of a tumultuous time. Uh, they fired the last guy I bring in. I'm, I'm the cleanup guy and they bring me in. Uh, they, that happened over a weekend. So they fire the guy on Friday. I take over on Monday and first questions out of everybody's mouth, which, you know, obviously this is not a pleasant situation anyway. First questions that I was asked on Monday morning when, when I show up as the new guy were, is there a dress code? And what is our, what are our work hours? And I'm like, really? Those are your first two questions you're going to ask me? Does this not say, hey, look, look at our mission. I mean, we got a mega problem here right now. So I said, number one, there is no dress code. Just be professional. And I said, and secondly, I don't care what hours you work because I don't want to keep office hours. I said, come in when you want to come in, get your work done and leave when you need to leave. If you're not doing your work, then I'm going to hold you accountable for it. And they're like, <gasps> and it took a while for them right. to accept the fact that, Hey, this really was true. So, you know, cause I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I like to be the gooder guy. Right. So then how does embracing that play oriented mindset how does that help a business um, not only survive, but actually thrive? I think when you come from a play-oriented mindset, you come with much more empathy 
much more understanding. Mm -hmm. You're giving an opportunity for people to fail. Well, you know, usually when I, I tell my story, right, you know, I, um, I built a business on play. I, 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 I bumped into an organization where they were teaching kids engineering with Lego. There were seven people, you know, and I joined it just because it was like, oh, they play for a living. And then over the next 15 years, we built the largest Lego STEM educational organization in the US. But we did it by just making stuff up as we went along. We had no idea what we were doing. We picked cities because they were fun. We hired people because they were fun. We had no business plan. We were just messing around, just experimenting all the time. And I was like, this works. And then while I was there, I was meeting all these other companies that were doing the exact same thing. So then when I was in the Bay Area at the time, when we started getting attention from the Facebooks, the Googles, you know, the Adobe's, and we would come in and they'd be like, hey, do you do team building events? We'd be like, yeah, of course, even though we didn't, we would just say yes to everything, right? <laughs> and, we would, and we started running them over the next five to seven years. I was like, wait a minute, like you are the top tech companies like in the world. And you claim to be disruptive, you claim to be innovative, you claim to be agile, like all those buzzwords. But this is not a safe space. This is not a playful space. This is not a place where people can take risks. This might have been at one point when you were a startup in your garage, but right now it seems way too stiff and way too professional. And you know, us coming in to infuse some play, to show what it's like to create a safe space, to take risks, like in a lot of our workshops, we're, we're helping people have hard conversations in a safe environment so they can have them out there, you know, in the actual work environment. But we're, we're giving people an opportunity to not only fail, but we're giving them an opportunity to not be judged. Because mm. I think a lot of times we're so worried about being judged and that puts so much stress on us. Yeah, you know, I got to think about how so many managers out there. I'm not sure how they become managers. First, that's the first question. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. I know how they become managers. They did their job well. And then someone's like, hey, you did your job well. So now you should be a manager of other people, it's even though truth. you have no management skills. Yeah, that's, I, that's how a lot that, of managers. E either that or you promote people to their highest level of incompetency. That's, exactly. called the, that's actually called exactly. the Peter principle, exactly. I think. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so many managers, and I'm using air quotes, managers, um, I think when they're stressed, they tend to revert to like the rules and the numbers yep. and, and yep. the Excel, Excel spreadsheet and the results and stuff like that. And like, yep. you know, they start putting these uh, restraints on their employees. We got to meet these goals. We got to do this and that. And all it does is shut down creativity. Hurt, exactly. like you said, Jeff, it trashes productivity and it makes people hate their job and want to leave basically. And that's not a good environment for a successful company. And I know there's this one guy out there. He says, the bigger companies get, the dumber they get. They do. They and, really and do. Because they lose that personal touch and stuff like that. And so they're so results orientated. And oh, we got to keep the stock price up. And yep. you know, this month we did. Here's the thing. Even if you have a great quarter, they're going to want to have a better quarter the next quarter. Yep. There is no, hey, let's relax the third quarter and fourth quarter will make it. No, it's always more pressure. So what is letting go of results actually allow companies to achieve more? It allows them to actually build businesses that are, will thrive in the long, in the long game. You know, Simon Sinek talks a lot about the finite game or the infinite game. What is your company doing? You know, Apple is playing the infinite game. They're they're like, you know, they might not make the best products all the time, but he would talk about how like, he would be like, yeah, we're focused on trying to just create the best thing for us. While other organizations are like, we got to beat this, this competitor this quarter. But when you're thinking that long-term and being like, I want to build, you know, this, this, you know, revolutionary business or this revolutionary organization or campaign or whatever it is that you're trying to create, and you're thinking so much further down the road, then you're able to like not focus on the petty little things of just the quarterly results. The reason why you're running the quarterly results is because you're worried about getting fired. But let's say, let's say you meet four quarters in a row, right? And then the next quarter you don't, they're starting to talk to you about getting fired. Like that's yeah. not a, that's not a situation where people can actually be creative. You know, if you're, if you want, if you want innovation, 
you're going to have to allow people the opportunity to fail. You know, mm -hmm. the, the companies that are failing the most, even Amazon fails a ton. They do it, but they give their freedom for their staff to actually do that. You know, um, the companies that are willing to, to take the biggest risks are the ones that are going to be around. You know, while other companies are going to be having meetings where they're where they're going to be like, you know what, I'm, I'm hearing about this new organization called Netflix and they're mailing DVDs to people. Wow, that sounds stupid. Well, you know, you can never build a business off that, you know, and guess what happened to that company? That was Blockbuster and they're gone now. Say, that's so Blockbuster. Like, you know, so we, have to be, we have to be, not only are you doing it because, you know, it's better for all of your staff. But you're going to become obsolete if you don't start to embrace a more play-oriented focus when you're building your business. Well, and look at Amazon. Amazon started off selling books, mm -hmm. and look at look at that. Look at what they did. So they they fit the model of of doing exactly what you're saying. So then, when when is it evidence? I mean, it's easy to look at someone like Amazon and say, "Hey, hey, they did that right." So when is it evident that play has actually worked in business? If you think of any startup, especially the ones that are now changing the worlds, the Facebook, the Googles, the Ubers, the, you know, you know, all of them, Apple, they started in a garage with a couple people that were just playing. That's all they were doing. That's all they were doing. They were just like, let's try to figure out this problem. Oh, let's experiment with this. Let's experiment with that. Like, all, all of like the Wright brothers, when they created the airplane, were playing. And a lot of people at first in there, if you want read that book, it's fascinating. The, at first, a lot of the neighbors in their town were laughing at them. But then after a while, they were like, wow, they're actually getting close. And then the, the town started to help them. Right. And actually, this is a perfect example. Right. You know, so the Wright brothers are b building this airplane. Their neighbors are laughing at them, but then they start to be like, wow, they're doing pretty well. So hey, hey, let's start helping them. Meanwhile, while this is happening, I believe it was Ford and Chrysler were also investing in the top scientists in the world to build an airplane at the exact same time as the Wright brothers. These two mechanics <laughs> that were playing versus the, the biggest corporations at the time with all of the money and the smartest people in the room. Why did the Wright brothers get there first? Because they were playing the whole time, because they're open to experimenting, because they're open to failure. That is the difference. That's why play is so important. Yeah, it's interesting. They were bicycle mechanics. <laughs> yeah, bicycle mechanics. Not even and, mechanics, bicycle mechanics. Exactly. Yeah, and, and, and I'm sure they probably didn't have the name aeroplane. They probably called it a flying machine. So what are you building over there? Right. Oh, well, we're, oh, we're building a flying machine. Oh, you're building a flying machine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, look what happened, you know? Um, yeah, I, I remember I've, I've been working from my home for like I don't know, 20 years now, but I remember when I used to be in the office, the only play toy you would see that was kind of like, accepted in the audience was the basketball hoop over the garbage can right so, right right so right, that right. you could throw your yeah, 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 yeah. there it is yeah he's Holy got one in the background ladies and gentlemen arcade back there. one in the background so you were supposed to like take your you know waste paper right. crunch it up and then throw it and then then it transitioned radically from that to the nerf one yeah where it was okay to have the basket with the nerf yep. ball but that was it, it that, that was, was the it. only play that was there and uh, I actually worked for uh, the New York Times for like 10 years, but it was actually the division called Golf Digest and Tennis Magazine. We did, we, did the, um, we did the magazines there. And I was in the, uh, the advertising department there. And th so there were golf clubs all over the place. It, it, was, it was wild. This is Golf Digest, you know what I mean? That's and awesome. I remember I was in uh, our, our office when I was the assistant art director at the time. And we had these Duncan Munchkins that, you know, the little donuts and they were they sat around all day and they got a little hard so i'm just playing around so i take one i put it on the floor and i take a five iron and i'm aiming it towards this garbage can down down the uh, other end of the <laughs> art department and my boss is sitting right next to it so i take it with one shot and i hit it and it literally i don't know how this happened i hit a line drive and it literally went into the garbage can but the air the mar margin of error to go in was minuscule and went in, he looked at him, he looked at me, he's like, how did you do that? I'm like, eh, you know. Yeah, you know. Yeah, uh, just just... My, one, my one hit wonder. He's like, that's amazing. <laughs> but, you know, 
I didn't do, I was trying to smash the munchkin in the air with the, with the thing, but it was so stale. I went in there, but it was fun. You know, it made the day. So I took a risk and, and uh, yeah, I think doing that, what's the harm, you know, you what, clean I mean, up, I mean, big deal. The, we're trying to think about it. We are at work. You know, I calculated the other day, if you're going to work, you know, and working, I think it's like eight and a half, 8.8 .8 hours, you might be at work for 2,500 hours in a given year, you know, and you only have 8,760 8, hours total in a year. So, you know, that is almost a third of your time. So why wouldn't we be having more fun then? And why wouldn't you be double downing on the things that people love to do? And also just doing the stuff you just said, right? Where, where it's not always about production. We are not machines. So we need to stop treating ourselves that way. And, and I think that's a good point. I also think that we use money as money and advancement as the reward. Right. And at the end of the day, you could have a, you could, you, oh, hey, how was day? Oh, great. I made me a vice president. That's good. Now you get more work and more responsibility, more pressure, more stress to do. Well, that stinks. You know, I want to have more fun. You know, I want to, I want to, I want a way to like say, hey, how was your work day? Well, we had a blast. It was all, I don't remember what I did, but I'm sure we got a lot of stuff done, but we had a great day of work. Right. Like if you think about most, uh, companies solutions to things it's always the answer of more oh we're not getting enough clients we need to do more phone calls more emails more outreach more you know we need to throw more money at it it's just always more rarely is it ever less and this is like can we have less stress you know you know Amen. can we have less less uh, long wasted meetings why is it a meeting Amen. even an hour long you know, meetings could be 12 minutes. Meetings could be walking meetings. Meetings could be like just hanging out. I know a team leader right now, the only meeting he has with all of his staff is lunch virtually. He does that every couple of days. That's probably the most important thing he does for his team all week. And he's not working at all during that time. He's just connecting with them and building trust and just creating good memories. Can mm. we focus more on that instead of trying to just bombard people with more and more work and more and more stress. Yeah. Hey, and we do this little thing, uh, Jeff, uh, it's called the cowboy quote of the day. And today's cowboy quote of the day is actually one I came up with. It's, is it wrong to quote myself in the cowboy quote of the day? Cowboy quote of the day says this, work is play, play is work. If you can combine the two, it's amazing how much more happy and productive your life is going to be. So that's what we're trying to get across here. So the one of the last questions we'll ask you is, what is unnatural about the eight-hour workday, and how do we even change it? I think, well, I started answering it already a little bit, mm -hmm. is, is I think we have to look at not focusing on the hours, right? And focusing on helping our staff to be paid more to be themselves. How go. do we there get them in that space where they can actually do the work that they're meant to do, right? Because when you th think about it, if you can figure out a way to get your staff in, um, in more of their flow state on a regular basis, less turnover, you know, more productivity, Happier, happier employees that are actually telling others to be like, hey, come to this company because this is where you can be yourself, right? And, and ultimately tying it back into the podcast, less stress, right? Yeah. Because I consider worry, I consider worry to be a wasted emotion. I think we spend way too much on worry. And I remember um, my friend Sally Holt recently said that she was, you know, she had been diagnosed with cancer and then went into remission and was able to take care of all of it you know, and then was coming into a meeting and she was sitting in a meeting and they're stressing out about some deadline, right? Even the word deadline, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh my gosh, oh, the quarterly, if we don't meet the quarterly results, oh, it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be a disaster. And she was just on the brink of death. And she's like, what are y'all stressing about? Like, we're totally stressing about the wrong things. We've totally forgotten about what, what, what are we doing here in the first place? And, and I'll, I'll tie it in with this is, is, you know, I know a lot of people that are famous, rich, 
you know, have everything that could buy whatever they want. And I think a lot of them suffer from affluent deadness as I coined. And what I mean by that is like, they have everything and they're not happy. You know, they either are worried that they're going to lose all their stuff or they have a net worth of 5 million, but they are comparing themselves to someone else that has $10 million or they just seem super bored. And so, so, and then they post on Instagram that they're, they're so happy and they're just, they love their life and they're so rich. And then I asked them, I'm just like, what are you doing? And they're like, oh, you know, I just want to get validation when you know that they're not that happy. And then they sell this story to the rest of us to try to get up there. And it's just like, what are we doing? They're up there stressed out. People are down here trying to get up there and they're stressed out. And we're just running in this like hamster wheel that's just a waste of time. When really the biggest challenge is figuring out what brings you joy right now? What makes you feel and come alive right now? Because like Howard Thurman says, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive. Because what the world needs is for more people to come alive. So that's what my ask is for your listeners. What makes you come alive? Do more of that and find your play because that's where the answers are. Mm. That's fantastic. Brother Rich, what you got? I think he's covered it really well. I'm going to go out and play the rest of the day. <laughs> I like, I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I, my wife and I'll be out for going for a walk and I'll just start doing like hopping or skipping yes. or doing my, my yes. silly dance or a silly walk. And she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm having fun. She's like, why are you doing that? I mean, she's a wonderful person. We're just opposites and opposites attract. But I, I mean, I, I, I'll go out to dinner with people that are just like really boring back when you could do it before the rona and uh i'll just start doing funny goofy stuff like you know i mean you know hey, 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 how you doing? it's like just let's just cut up and they're like and it just makes them like shrink in all the more but i have noticed this and i noticed you you mentioned it too jeff is when dealing with negative depressed toxic people the one universal tool to unlock them and get them out of that is fun yeah it is. And if you think of like someone that is boring, right? You know, they're boring because right now they're so worried about what everyone else is doing and they're trying to meet all these expectations. And what you do, the gift you're giving when you just are your full self, right? Is you're giving them just a little permission to be more of themselves because you're willing to, you're the first through the wall. You're the first to be silly. You're the first one to be like, I'll draw attention to myself. And then watch, those boring people are not actually boring. They just have like been pushing down their inner child for so long. And now you're helping them actually unleash it. And they won't thank you at that moment, but at some point they will be really happy that you exist in the world. Mm, that's good stuff. Hey, uh, Jeff, tell everybody about your show and tell everybody about your most recent guest. <gasps> Oh, so I, I run a show um, that I haven't really posted that much yet called Playing, Playing Through Awkward Conversations. Um, and I've been fascinated most recently with death. So I've been talking with my friend Lauren Yee and, and Julie DeCaneva about like, what's fun about death? <laughs> like, it's really weird, but like there's something powerful about the fact that when you're able to really embrace death, you actually now learn how to live. Like you actually, as someone says, you actually gain a second life when you understand how to actually die. Mm. And that, and that's fascinating to me. So that is what I've been talking about. <laughs> There's a, uh, I quote, I talk about my Mima all the time. She was 93 when she passed away. But what you just said triggered another memory uh, of her. Um, she was coming in towards the end of, of her, of her time on this side of eternity. And the doctor uh, said, that his goal was to keep her alive for three more months because in three more months, she would have celebrated her 75th wedding anniversary. So he said, Mrs. Dobbs, my goal is to keep you alive until you can celebrate that anniversary. And she looks at him and she goes, who cares? <laughs> I love this. I love She's that like, so much. I'm ready to go. <laughs> My my friend Matt, his grandma who lives near Lubbock, or her yeah, his grandma who lived, or great grandma who lived near Texas, or in near Lubbock, um, actually one time he saw her outside with her suitcases, 
No. And he's, he was like, and he was like, where are you going? He's just, I'm just getting ready to go. I'm just like, you know, I'm just packed up and ready. Like, like the humor of someone at that point, man, is so awesome. <laughs> uh, I love it. Well, Jeff, we can't tell you what an honor it's been to have you as a guest on our show. We say we do this uh, for ourselves. We started stress for you because we've said we did things so wrong for so long that now that we've kind of been figuring it out. We want to share that with other people. And therefore, you have also helped us as well. So thank you so much for that, brother. Thank you for being a guest. I can't wait till we actually uh, meet in person because I have a feeling we would play a lot. A lot. <laughs> thank, you so so, thank you so much, man. Hey, if you want additional information, you can go to his website, rediscoveryourplay.com. In addition, in the show notes are a couple of links that he's included uh, for you to be able to reach out. And then Jeff, oh, one thing, uh, tell everybody a little bit about the offering that you wanted to make for everyone. Yeah. So I um, added an offering when really it's a lot of like, if you're if getting tired of binge watching Netflix, right. And you're getting tired of, you know, like you just feel like you're in a rut, go to this link because it's a bunch of ways in which you can play to rediscover yourself. Right. And, and one of them, I'll just give you an example of one of them is what we talked about earlier, which is uh, called the tipsy brainstorm. And it's where you haven't done something fun in a really long time. I recommend you gather your friends on zoom Get a little tipsy with however you want to do that, whether that's alcohol, chocolate, ice cream, you know, playing basketball, whatever your thing is, but get into that mode and then brainstorm and then have your tipsy storm. Come up with all these crazy ideas of all these ways you can play. Go to bed that night. And in the morning when you wake up and you look at that list, one of those ideas is going to be the idea. So there's a bunch of ideas like that on there. So check that out. It's really awesome. That's fantastic. We thank you for your time. No matter where you're at in the world, we hope that this episode has helped you become more stress-free. And as always, thanks for listening. In our future episodes, we will dive deeper into ways to enable you to live the stress-free life you were destined to live. We invite you to come along for the journey to create a stress-free you because it really is a wonderful life. For more information, visit us at stressfreeu.net or send us an email to info at stressfreeu.net. Thank you for subscribing to the Stress Free You Show wherever you get your podcast, and thanks for listening.